Hi, I'm Shan Wu with an undercolor of law hot take on the long anticipated ruling by Judge Juan Mershon on Trump's violations of his gag order in the Manhattan District Attorney's case. Now, this is the case of the election interference against Trump. Recall that the case involves the paying of money to actress director Stormy Daniels in order to keep quiet about their affair. Now, a central piece of the judge's ruling is going to be how he used Trump's own words against him to find him in violation. The case is about the falsification of business records for the purpose of interfering with an election, meaning they didn't want to have it known that this was happening to help his election chances. And that aspect, that intent to interfere with the election, is what moves the case from just simple falsification of business records, which is a misdemeanor, but that intent to commit another felony is what bumps it up. And so that is a portion of it that needs to be proven with regard to the political motivation for it. At issue here is the gag order, and the gag order prohibits Trump from making or directing others to make public statements about known or reasonably foreseeable witnesses concerning their potential participation in the investigation or in this criminal prosecution. So the prosecutors alleged 10 different violations of this, primarily through posts that Trump did. Now, Judge Mershon found all but one of those constituted a violation. And for each of the nine violations, Trump was fined $1,000 per violation and explicitly warned that incarceration could result from further violations. Now, the first thing I know many of us were thinking is, what took so long? And now that we finally know what the punishment is, why is it so light? So why it took so long probably involves the judge not wanting to have a delaying sideshow right at the start of the trial. He wanted to move past the jury selection, get through opening statements, and now we're really into substantive testimony. Also, there's a pattern that's been building up of the violations, and so these are 10 that were alleged, and the judge ruled on those, but there's actually an additional one that's going to be scheduled for hearing on Thursday. There are four more. As to why the punishment is so light, the answer to that really lies in the somewhat confusing New York State laws about criminal contempt violations, which is what this is. Now, even though the judge refers to this as criminal contempt, it's not an actual criminal charge, so it's not an actual conviction. Here's why. A conviction would have been brought under a particular New York law, section 215.50. That type of charge would have been a standalone separate criminal case. You'd have to have a separate charging document, such as an indictment or a complaint, and then you'd have to have a whole trial to prove with evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that the contempt had happened. Now, that would obviously cause great delay because it's basically a whole separate criminal case. In contrast to the way that was done here, where the Manhattan DA's office chose to proceed under Section 750 and 751 of the New York State law. Those sections cover this notion of criminal contempt and specifically where the contempt is being found for the willful disobedience of a court order, namely the gag order. Under these provisions, the maximum punishment that can be given is a $1,000 fine for each violation and or imprisonment if the fines will be insufficient to deter or punish the conduct. That explains why it's only $1,000 per violation. Now, because the judge refers to this as criminal contempt, a lot of commentators and viewers naturally may think that it is a separate criminal case, and therefore the punishment seems light. But it's not. And a little bit of Latin here, uh, this is what's called in law a sui generis category of cases. So it's not really a pure criminal case, it's not a civil contempt. That term, sui generis, just means that it's a unique category of a proceeding. And so the proceeding and the punishment fits within an existing criminal case, but it's not a separate one. You can contrast that 
with a civil contempt proceeding of the kind that we saw in the defamation case involving E. Jean Carroll, where Trump was fined higher amounts in that case. I think it was up to 10,000 per violation for violating the gag order there. But in this proceeding, <clears throat> the prosecution brought it under 750 and 751, so that limited the range of punishments to the $1,000 per violation. He didn't have any discretion to go higher than that. And even though he acknowledged, in his opinion, that $1,000 is not very likely to have much of an effect on someone who can afford that, like Trump. But he also pointed out in his ruling that incarceration is potentially available as well. So that's why this rather complicated New York legal system explains the punishments in this case. And in order to reach the finding of the violation, the judge had to first consider the prosecution's arguments and Trump's lawyers' defenses. And in particular, this was a situation involving what Trump's lawyers were calling reposts. And the judge said that this was a question of first impression, meaning what exactly are reposts? Are they violations in the sense that Trump himself was saying them? Or as Trump's lawyers were arguing, it's not only him saying them, he's just like repeating what other people have said. Because it's a case of first impression, there was an existing legal precedent for the judge to use. And he said that he would rely upon common sense, kind of refreshing <laughs> in the court. And he relied upon Trump's own words and Trump's own brags and boasts were used against him. So he looked at what in the past Trump has said about his own social media posts, in particular, what he posts on with the truth social media. And he quoted from Trump saying that, quote, true social is the primary way I get the word out. And for better or worse, people want to hear what I have to say, unquote. Trump also said, quote, when I put out a statement, it is spread all over the place fast and furious. Everybody seems to get whatever I have to say. And quickly, if it didn't work or probably get the word out, I wouldn't use it. End of quote. So with these words, Trump basically screwed himself because what he's really doing is he's adopting everything that he reposts, retweets, whatever he wants to call it, because he's really making it his own message. So those posts, the judge reasoned, are intended to be really effective at getting out Trump's message because if it wasn't effective, as he said, he wouldn't be using them. So that I found to be really critical and rather interesting in this age of social media on how that was analyzed by the judge. And when the judge took that into account, as well as the rest of the evidence, he found beyond a reasonable doubt that Trump should be held in criminal contempt. Now that's the highest standard there is in the law is beyond a reasonable doubt, the same one that's found for a actual conviction. Something the judge had to take into account was the defense that Trump's attorney was making, which was kind of this nonsensical idea that everything he says is protected First Amendment speech because it's political speech, because he is running for office, and in particular, because he claims he's responding to political attacks. The judge made quick work of that very weak defense, although he was careful about it. Remember, we've discussed before about what role the First Amendment plays in criminal cases, which is none, <laughs> unless it's being used as a defense to the actual charge. And here, he isn't using it as a defense to the actual charge. He's just saying that you would be wrong if you tried to gag me because that would violate the First Amendment. The authority of a court in a criminal case contains the ability to lawfully restrict free speech about the case if it runs the risk of hurting the integrity of the criminal case and or threatening the safety of witnesses or jurors, which would affect the integrity of that case. So first, you may recall that Trump's lawyers really did a lousy job on this point, probably because they're too busy kissing up to Trump to really be able to find any evidence. In fact, his lawyer, Todd Blanche, was unable to actually give the judge any examples of where Trump was supposedly replying to political attacks. 
Again, this goes back to Trump's idea that because he likes to criticize the case as being all political, he thinks that makes everything he says in the case political. That's simply not a logical continuation. So the judge tried to give them a chance and said, okay, you're saying these are his responses to political attacks. Tell me, what are some of those attacks? Nothing. Secondly, the judge pointed out that even in cases where later on an order such as this gag order was found to be unlawful or that the finding of the violation rather was found to be unlawful, doesn't matter. It still stands. This kind of relates to a point that we discussed earlier that the First Amendment violation has no effect on a conviction. Because later, let's say that a court of appeals or the Supreme Court found that this was an unconstitutional gag order. It was too broad. If there's an acquittal, not going to matter at all. And if there's a conviction, it's not going to matter at all. But nonetheless, the court was careful in their analysis. Of the 10 alleged violations, there was one in which the judge thought there might be a doubt reasonable doubt whether Trump might have been responding to a more political aspect in that. That specifically involved comments that Stormy Daniels' former attorney, Michael Avenatti, had made. And so the judge felt that there was some question as to whether those circumstances perhaps made it more political than other posts. And so he excluded that from the other nine that he said were violations. Importantly, he also said that to be fair, the enforcement of the gag order cannot be used as a sword rather than a shield. Now that was likely directed towards Michael Cohen, who continues to speak out quite voluminously about Trump. A lot of people raise the question of, is that fair that Cohen isn't gagged when Trump is? Well, a witness is in a very different position than a defendant, and certainly in a very different position than a defendant like Trump, who has a mouthpiece that reaches millions of people. So the answer to the question a lot of Trump supporters say, which is, how is it fair that Trump's gagged when you know, witnesses are not gagged, something which Trump constantly says, the answer is that there's a far greater danger posed by Trump to the integrity of the trial. And he is the defendant who is more naturally subject to the restrictions because the case is about him. It's not Michael Cohen on trial after all. So after reviewing the law here carefully and the analysis that the judge put out for this, we understand now why the fines were only $1,000. And we also understand why the judge made it quite explicit to Trump that imprisonment is on the table because the statute actually says that maximum $1,000 fine and or imprisonment. So here, the court put Trump on notice that incarceration is a possibility and that the court will not tolerate continued willful violations of its lawful order. The judge is telling Trump that if necessary, he will use, in his words, an incarceration punishment. Now, keep in mind, the maximum for that kind of punishment would be 30 days. In other words, the judge can't just willy-nilly sentence Trump to like 10 years for violating the gag order. But interestingly, it's 30 days for each offense, each violation. <laughs> so if you have 10, 12, 14, you get the picture. It theoretically could add up to a lengthy sentence of time. Although realistically, I don't think that the judge would do something called run them consecutively. But nonetheless, you may hear a lot of talk in the media or in social media about how theoretically with all these violations, Trump could be facing months and months in jail or even years. That's not very likely to happen. More likely to happen is if the judge really wanted to get his message across for repeated violations, he might put Trump in the back for the afternoon in the holding cell. He could also use another interesting option, which is to say that I'm not gonna put you in jail right now during the trial, but I'm telling you that's the punishment. At the end of this trial, whether you are convicted or acquitted, you're going to do the following 
time in jail as punishment for having violated this order. It's criminal contempt. Now, I don't think there's any real logistical difficulty to putting Trump in jail, unlike a lot of commentators, because I believe that jails are very secure places and they can be unsafe places. But with the Secret Service protection, it will be easy to keep him safe. It's easy to observe who's coming to see him. And there's not going to be any real threat to his safety in jail, nor is it the same as imprisoning the Secret Service. But I think the judge is a very fair person, and he's not looking to make his own reputation by slapping some long jail sentence on Trump, unless Trump keeps violating the order. And my view of it has been, I wish the judge had made this decision faster and earlier, because I think a lot of damage has already been done with Trump's statements. Certainly, there seems to be a deterrent effect on Trump already. In the last few days, he seems to have tamped down on some of his postings. Now, you can say that this is another example of how Trump benefits from a two-tier system of justice. And I think you'd be right. Most other people would long ago have faced fines and probably been put in the back. But nonetheless, I think there is some reason for optimism here because the system is at least moving forward. There is an actual trial of a former president despite all of his power, despite all of his efforts to delay the matter. And we should be grateful for the work of the Manhattan District Attorney's Office and brave witnesses like Stormy Daniels and Michael Cohen who have come forward. And it's a really historical point that this judge has for the first time held a former president of the United States in criminal contempt. He found that criminal contempt using the beyond reasonable doubt standard. That says something positive about our system of criminal justice. Even though there's a lot about the system that is unjust at times, times it doesn't work very well, but there are efforts being made to apply it to all people, regardless of who they are or what office they have held. So that's it for now. Thanks for listening to this hot take on this long awaited gag order. And I'm looking forward to talking to you in the future. And again, thank you for all the comments. I like reading them and I like getting ideas from them. So we'll talk to you soon. Enough! Send it to the big house, not the White House. Get the new exclusive teas, mugs, and stickers right now at store.midastouch.com. That's store.midastouch.com.